Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Quentin Atkinson. He's a professor in psychology at the University of Auckland, where he runs the Language, Cognition and Culture Lab, and also co-director of the University of Auckland Behavioral Insights Exchange. He uses lab and field experiments, computer modeling and evolutionary theory to shed light on the evolution of human culture and cognition. His work answers questions including the origins of linguistic diversity, the function of religion, the psychology of climate change, how evolved cognitive biases shape our social behavior, and why political systems vary the way they do around the globe. And we're going to talk about some of those topics today. So, Dr. Atkinson, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. So, let's start with a little bit of politics. Uh, I would like to ask you about the foundations, particularly the cultural foundations of modern democracy. So, uh, was democracy brought about by cultural values or, or were these a, a response to democratic institutions? I mean, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a, obviously it's a pertinent issue today is, is um, you know, there are questions raised about the future of democracies around the world. Um, the, and there are debates about what comes first, if you like, um, the values that give rise to these institutions, or is it that the institutions come first and they give rise to democratic values? Um, yeah, and the, I mean, history is long and complex and a, a full account of it all is uh, certainly beyond me today, but the, we have done some work on this, looking at this link, this connection between values and democratic institutions. Um, one of the things I've done is um, use uh, long-term historical coded data of the democratic status of nations around the world. There are a number of data sets that track this amazing data sets over sometimes a couple of hundred years. Like the, the polity data set is one of the most well known, but there are others. Um, and they, they, they rank um, or score nations um, on a spectrum from being autocratic to democratic on a whole lot of criteria. Um, and so one of the things we uh, did in a project with um, Damien Ruck and Alex Bentley uh, and others is um, look at the association between those scores over a couple of hundred years and some estimates of values through time in the nations that we had this democratic score data on. And the values data um, was a really nice um, use of the World Values Survey that um, I think Damien and Alex came up with, which was, uh, th this is a survey that's run all around the world in many countries, thousands of people, and um, they it's been running since I think the early 80s. So there's like now 40 or so years of data. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can look at how nation's values change through time. But one of the things that um, was added to that is um, that uh, you can also look at the, the values of individuals within a time slice. And there are individuals of different cohorts, different ages in a particular time slice, like in the year 1990. And the... Um, what uh, Damien and others have exploited is this idea that um, the oldest individuals in that time slice are going to be give you a, an estimate of values at a much earlier time because um, the argument goes values kind of become established in your early adulthood and don't change much after that. So you can take you can get from this 40 years of world values survey data given that some of the oldest people in the data set and the earliest waves might be 80 
70 years old, you can go back maybe 100 years. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we did was look at the relationship between these values and the democratic scores in these nations around the world. And the two are related, that had been shown, that had been shown before. Um, but what we did in this study was to look at, well, do, do you get values predicting later democratic um, institutions, or is it the institutions predicting later democratic values, or do you get both? Mm -hmm. And um, what we found in that study was that um, cosmopolitan values, so values to do with openness to diversity and diversity of views, um, predicts later shifts to more democratic institutions. Um, and also found that uh, you can predict changes. Um, another factor is institutional confidence. So basically, if people tend to be less, if they're less confident in the institutions, then that predicts a switch in the institutions, be it from democracy. So if they're not so confident in the democratic institutions, you're more likely to get a switch to autocracy. And if they're not so con confident in the autocratic, you get a switch back to democracy. So these two things, the way people's confidence in their institutions allowed us to predict future changes in democratic institutions. But what we didn't find was the democracy, the institutional scores, like how democratic the actual institutions were, didn't seem to predict changes uh, later in the values. Um, so this speaks to this question of what's driving what, and at least our study showed that um, it looks like the values are key. Um, and you, you didn't get this, um, yeah, this effect of institutions causing a change in values. That also held controlling for some other factors um, like generalized trust and GDP per capita. Um, so there's this, it does look like there's a link and it looks like it goes in the direction from values to institutions. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, of course, you mentioned some cultural databases there. Uh, I would like to ask you, how can we study relationships of descent between cultures? Um, well, cultures are related in lots of different ways, um, but... Um, the, yeah, and so there are a lot of ways that you could track relationships of descent. You could look at where people have come from, or you can look at where the language they speak has come from, or their religious ancestry. These are all legitimate answers to the question of, you know, cultural descent, where, where the peoples have come from. Um, and they're all interesting. The, the work I have done, um, is kind of builds on or more of work I've been doing modeling language evolution and later religious evolution. Um, so you can, based on similarities between the world's languages, you can say something about how they're related to one another, build these language family trees, which map out relationships of descent between the speakers of those languages. And um, just like words are inherited down those lineages you might expect other cultural replicators other features of the culture might be inherited down those lineages um, these are particularly coherent lineages they have to be because languages you know they can't change so much that speakers can't um of the, in the same group can't understand one another mm -hmm. um so uh yeah the work we've been doing in my lab is to take some of that scholarship on the relationships between the world's languages and map it on to some of these other data sets, other features that we're interested in and use it as a kind of scaffolding to model processes of cultural evolution along the branches of the tree. And it's been done quite a long, for quite a long time in anthropology, looking at um, the evolution of um, traits in traditional societies. Um, one of the things we've been doing more recently is 
looking at kind of uh, in, variation in you know large scale modern societies today and asking you know do these relationships of descent that connect um, countries around the world say based on the languages they speak do they predict anything in the variation we see out there uh, all around the world um, so um, yeah, we've started to do that. And one of the one of the applications of that was to this democracy question, actually. So we just had a, a paper come out on this. Uh, there's lots of people are interested in democratic variation around the world. As I said, one predictor might be the values people have. But um, there's been all kinds of work by economists and sociologists and others looking at the, the kind of country level predictors of democracy. Is it to do with economic development? Is it to do with where they are in the world? Is it to do with features of the climate uh, or what social factors? And um, there's, as part of that, economic historians are interested in culture and the role of culture in shaping the, the you know, global geopolitical landscape and where we see democracies. Um, and yeah, there's less, there's been less work um, on tracing these deeper historical connections or sometimes prehistorical connections between um, countries based on the languages they speak. Um, and so, yeah, we've applied this approach to this question of the spread of democracy and, and just the patterns of democracy around the world. Um, it's useful for a couple of reasons. One is nations around the world are not independent data points and they're often treated like they are independent right uh, and that's a problem for just about any statistical test that uses that data um so it seems like a standard response to that problem is to just ignore it uh but if you don't want to ignore it you can try and model the non-independence and to do that, you need some proxy for, you know, how much to nations co-vary. Um, and economists and others have used um, things like geographic distance as a proxy for that. The closer they are, the less independent they are. It's a pretty reasonable proxy. Um, but we're, this work we've been doing has been looking at, well, how well does language ancestry do as a, as a proxy? Is it any does it add anything to geography is it better than geography is it and is it an explanation of co-variation in these different outcomes mm -hmm. um but the other reason to do it is just it's interesting in itself if we want to understand the process of cultural evolution and the spread of democracy say you want to quantify the effects of things like cultural ancestry because it tells you something about the process by which any idea or institution or whatever spreads um, right. And so this work has been using these language trees alongside other predictors to try and say something, to, to try and control for non-independence and then say something about the, the process. Um, yeah, so we look at geography as a predictor on its own, which is, like I said, long been an interest. Um, and then we look at language. We've also got religious affiliations between nations. And we ask what ones do the best job of predicting outcomes. Um, and um, we find that geography is a pretty good predictor. Language on its own, uh, at least in the data we looked at, again, these we were looking at these large um, democratic outcome data sets that have data from a couple of hundred years. Um, language seems to be better on its own than geography is on its own, but also you, if, you, if you put them both in the model, language clearly explains additional variance to geography. Um, so that's interesting, but also interesting. Religion 
is important too. And in a model that includes geography, language, and religion, they can you can go through periods of history where one is more important than the other. Um, but one of the findings we have is that the language ancestry effect seems to be yeah, among the most what's well, the most robust through time, um, stronger and more reliable than geography. And both language and religion in recent times over the last few decades seem to be becoming more important. Um, that may have tapered off slightly in the last few years, but there's something about the trajectory over the last few decades that seems to be linked to this cultural ancestry. Um, and we think that's interesting. It could be because um, so there are some features to do with democratic institutions that are like directly inherited by uh, down these linguistic or religious lineages. But another possibility is that the those language lineages are proxies. Well, that they predict something like um, more connections between countries. So say um, Spanish and Portuguese are relatively closely related into European languages and maybe um, maybe there are similar institutions because they were inherited from the common ancestor of Spanish and Portuguese, which is some version of um, Latin, I suppose, or one of its later derivatives. Um, but it's also possible that the, the cultural connections between Portugal and Spain have left a legacy today. So there are just more connections, more like trade connections or social network connections between the two. And that, that's where ideas flow. Mm -hmm. um, or a third possibility is there aren't more connections, but for a given number of connections between two more closely related cultures, you're just more likely to get ideas or institutions flowing, being transferred mm -hmm. because of maybe other inherited similarities between the cultures. It's just, it's, it's, whatever is spread is more likely to fit. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a nice application, I think, of some of this um, work on human prehistory using language modeling that it might have relevance to how we understand um, the world today and geopolitical dynamics. I do think both that work and the work I was talking about with, with um, Damien Ruck and, and colleagues looking at values, um, both suggest that it might, it's not a good idea to just throw some institutions at a population and expect them to stick. These mm -hmm. things seem to um, uh, be reliant or, or be affected by the values of that population and aren't necessarily transferable between any two populations. So for example, um, not to get too political, but like US foreign policy in Iraq or Afghanistan, where it's, we go in guns blazing and set up the institutions and maybe don't think so much about the values and the compatibility with any given set of institutions may, may not be a great idea given these mm -hmm. findings. And, you know, there, there were people saying it wasn't a great idea before we published these papers, but that kind of supports that. Right. Uh, so uh, I would like to ask you also, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges with building comparative cultural databases? Um, well, there's... Um, what are the biggest challenges? It's not easy to do. I think the, the first thing is, um, so a lot of the work I've done has um, be, studied language evolution and mm -hmm. built language uh, comparative data sets and then used computer models to test hypotheses about what generated that data, where, where people came from, how it, how, to, mm -hmm. how to run. In some ways, language is an ideal model system for studying cultural evolution because it's it's more than any other aspect of culture i think um naturally broken up into these discrete units that i'm for example using now to communicate with you words 
in sentences and those words comprise um, phonemes and uh, so this kind of almost digital nature of language means that um, it's relatively easy to carve up into pieces that we know are going to be theoretically interesting like mm -hmm. what are the words I'm using what is the, what are the sounds what are the phonemes that make up those words and how how am I constructing my sentences um, but even with language uh, you need to have an idea of what it is exactly you want to test or what what what's your theoretical framework if you're going to create a useful data set um, so I think the main challenge is just being clear about the scope of the questions that you want to answer given a particular theory and making sure if nothing else you get the data to answer that question because there's so many ways of carving up cultural data that you can get it wrong otherwise um, and the units of analysis as well um, so these are these are all things that um, Ted Slingerland and, and others who we have a paper on this uh, in I think evolutionary human sciences um, so these aren't all my um, my own thoughts alone but the role of theory is one and then linked to that is the units of analysis so um, even for language uh, what's the appropriate unit of analysis like we can talk about the English language but do you mean across the entire English diaspora or do you mean um, modern standard English or within that do you mean a particular population of speakers or um, even dialect or, or even individual idiolects so how particular people speak um, all those are different units of analysis that you need to make decisions about um, and it's hard even with language um, but I guess I use the language example because it just gets even harder with something like religion um, like what are the what are the basic units of religion like the the equivalent of words and phonemes that we can carve it up I, I um, attempted to build uh, religious databases over the years and um, yeah it's certainly there are many ways one can carve up religious systems it's just so kind of multi-dimensional and, and complex um, yeah so there are two principal um, challenges um, and the other I mean there are more in the paper I mentioned but there the other one that I um, focus a lot on is just like a, a version of the data that's going to be open and usable and expandable by others and so that involves all these kind of best practice database mm -hmm. um, tools like uh, you know clear reliable static identifiers for every unit and every trait um, making your uh, data available in a raw form um, having everything open yeah all that stuff I don't know if that answers the question Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I know that you do work on climate change and I would like to ask you specifically, uh, does culture play a role in how we respond to it and to perhaps other large scale collective action problems? Yeah, well, I think culture is incredibly important, underemphasized, and there's, there's a bit, there's too much emphasis on the human response to these problems like climate change mm -hmm. I think as um, driven by human nature or, or um, biology um, I think it's incredibly culturally determined um, and so I mean the the context of that is arguments that you know when people see the lack of progress on something like climate change it's tempting to say well that's because of some feature of the human brain uh, like our inability to attend to things we can't see or our inability to care about things that are a long way away 
or our inherent priority we give to self-interest over the common good. And all these things, these features of our brains and biology prevent us from solving this problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that's problematic on a number of levels. First of all, it oversimplifies things. Um, we, yes, we often prioritize things we, we can see and, and are tangible, but there are a whole lot of, you know, uh, things that, that could influence our lives that are intangible. I mean, religion is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. it, people structure their entire lives around deities they, they never actually see. Um, so the idea that we don't care about stuff we can't see, like rising CO2, is just not plausible, I think. Um, the same with appeals to far-off places. We like some people have argued, like Thomas Sudendorf, for example, has argued that, that our ability to kind of mentally time travel and go, you know, create futures for ourselves is what defines us in a species. And the idea that that part of our psychology is what's holding us back just doesn't seem right to me um, and anyone who's read any actual evolutionary biology knows that it's it's not the case that we're all just uh wired to be selfish that there mm -hmm. it's you know there's um a whole lot of um apparatus there to help us cooperate and i think um it's wrong to point the finger at our ability to cooperate is what's holding us back to me, it seems pretty clearly cultural stuff. You can you can go to different populations around the world and find groups where nobody cares about this stuff and people are raging against even considering doing something about climate change and other populations where it's broadly recognized by everyone that it's a big deal and we need to do something about it. And I think the primary difference is uh, cultural ideology and norms and institutions not not biology right we, it's all basically the same um biology so yeah i think the problem lies in culture and and our at times religious blindness to the Im impact that culture has on us the um it seemed i've done a, a little bit of digging into the um the reporting around climate change and one of the things that's interesting is early on across the ideological spectrum like the political spectrum mm -hmm. the um for example right after james hansen's testimony to the US Congress in 1988 that climate change is a big deal and we need to do something about it. Um, publications across the political spectrum were like, yeah, we need to do something about it. Uh, it didn't matter if they were on the left or the right. And I think that's because that's the natural human reaction. Um, but it, a couple of years later, uh, it, after like the Kyoto Protocol, for example, the reporting changes uh, on the political right to be quite skeptical. And I don't think that's a natural human reaction. I think that's some machinations of ideology and power coming into play saying, well, maybe this idea isn't in the interests of our company or our uh, privileged position in society. And so we're going to challenge it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that stuff, which is cultural, is key to addressing this problem. Um, so it annoys me when I hear um, people boil it down to some element of human nature. I think that's overly simplistic. Mm -hmm. uh, focusing now on religion, what social functions does religion serve? Um, well, there's a, I guess there's a whole lot of candidates there and people have there are different people have written about different possible functions. Religious people live longer. 
they're reportedly happier and have more children. So if you value those things, they seem like important social functions. Um, also allaying stress um, and providing social support is another um, function that people have spoken a lot about. Um, and you might expect that to be most important in like especially stressful environments or among individuals who are at greater risk or exposed to stressors. Um, and, but the, another strand of work is that religion fosters cooperation and group cohesion. Um, and that's something that I've been really interested in and done a bit of work on. Um, and that itself is a diversity of ideas um, like it. What it is, what is it about religion that does that? Religion is not this like monolithic thing that that um, is designed by selection or individuals or whatever to do. So it's a kind of hodgepodge collection of things we, we often label together as religion. Um, so there are practices that might promote cohesion and cooperation mm -hmm. going back to like Emile Durkheim and his idea of like sacred worship of the society itself then that, that might bind a group to get together there's work uh, on like shared dysphoric arousals like really unpleasant or painful experiences with other people that binds them together um, synchrony is another one um, but as well as the practices, there's also work on the religious beliefs, um, like the encoding of moral obligations to others, explicitly um, prescribing consequences of moral transgressions, be they natural or supernatural. Um, and that all these things might work to promote cooperation and cohesion. And some have argued not just that those things can be kind of used to promote cohesion in a group, but that a collection of them or an elaboration of some of them might have been key to allowing societies to increase the scale at which they cooperate. Um, yeah, so, and so that it's not just you've got a society that needs some functions done and religion can serve those functions but that religion by allowing people to cooperate can change the nature of society. Mm -hmm. And of course we have to cooperate with lots of people that are non kin. And that implies that we have to monitor their behavior to some extent and punish them when necessary. Do religious beliefs also contribute to this? Um, Yes, yeah, so there's these lab studies showing that if you think that someone's monitoring you or you think you are going to be punished for defecting, then you're much more likely to cooperate in like economic games. Um, and it's, well, crucially, you don't actually need to do the monitoring or punishment um, to get these effects, just the expectation that you might be punished is enough to make people cooperate. Like the classic, um, like public goods game experiments where they introduce the threat of punishment to the participants. And then all of a sudden their cooperation rates go up, but nobody's actually done any punishment yet. Um, so yeah, clearly monitoring and punishment, uh, affect behavior and um, but the problem is they're costly to maintain, like credible, like plausible, maintaining the plausible idea that everyone is being monitored or that anyone might be punished if they do the wrong thing is going to be expensive. Mm -hmm. um, who's going to do all this monitoring and punishing? People have to believe it. And one idea is that religion can contribute to this via the idea of supernatural policing, that what if everyone believes that there are these supernatural agents out there who are really powerful and care whether you've done, whether you're, you know, treating your fellow community members well, and that they're willing to punish you if you don't abide by the rules that 
sometimes called the supernatural punishment hypothesis, supernatural policing, um, yeah, is is one way that religion might be working. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is the relationship between religion and social complexity? Uh, earlier, for example, you mentioned that uh, religion uh, contributed to the our being able to uh, co cooperate with more and more people with an increasing number of people. But I know that in recent years, for example, the big gods theory, uh, big gods theory has been challenged, which was basically the idea that uh, for human societies to become bigger and more complex, we needed moralizing gods and they came first and then came the, so, the increasing social complexity. So uh, what do you uh, think about it? Yeah, well, um, there has been a lot of work on this because it's a really interesting idea that religion might be functioning to actually uh, police society. Um, and I mean, there's, there's, the, there's a few pieces to the puzzle, right? There's the experimental stuff showing that it's psychologically plausible that these beliefs could have this effect on people's behavior. So like Sharif and Noren Zayn have this classic paper where they prime God concepts and show that people are more pro-social. Mm -hmm. um, so like Jesse Bering's work on the Princess Alice experiments where, you know, g getting kids to think that, there's this invisible princess in the room, and then they're more likely to um, play by the rules in a game they're given, or, or not, um, yeah, not take a reward they've been asked to leave on the table. Um, so that suggests we have this psychology, um, and I suppose, um, yeah, the. So one question is, uh, how widely does that apply? Like these studies are in like Western Christian societies. What about mm -hmm. elsewhere? Mm -hmm. um, and how reliable are those effects? Um, so there's been questions raised about that. And um, I know there's a, a, meta, a fairly recent meta-analysis showing that these priming religion or, or God concepts it is associated with pro-social behavior. Mm. Uh, also some work I've been involved in uh, through the field work I've done in Vanuatu uh, as part of the cultural evolution of religion consortium. We took some of these ideas to field sites all around the world and asked, um, you know, what's the association between belief in powerful deities who might punish you if you do wrong and behavior in uh, economic games and, and mm. behavioral experiments where you can measure whether people are following the rules or how generous they are. And um, what we found there was um, that across societies that belief in a more moralizing deity um, that was more willing to punish transgressions was mm -hmm. correlated with uh, uh, reduced willingness to violate some rules in a game we'd given people um, in their favor. So they were less likely to basically break the rules in their favor. Yeah. Um, and also a later follow-up that they were more generous to people who shared their religious beliefs, even in another community. Um, that's some fairly nice behavioral evidence. Uh, you know, obviously, it would be nice to get more. The, the, what we didn't do in those studies was priming. Um, it was just a correlation between people's beliefs and how they behaved. Um, and there were some attempts to do priming study, uh, priming experiments in that project that I believe didn't, you know, the results were sort of a bit equivocal. So there's more to say there, but it does look like there's suggestive evidence in terms of the behavioral side that, yeah, these deities seem to be associated with cooperation. Um, that doesn't answer the question of does it, it's psychologically plausible, but does it scale up to, is this like a real society level force that has actually right. allowed societies to increase 
in scale. And for that, you needed different kinds of evidence. Um, what we'd expect to see there to begin with is that, well, these deities that are moralizing and will punish people um, who transgress, they, if, if they're necessary, or at least, yeah, if they're necessary to get a really big society off the ground, then maybe they should be more likely in big societies around the world. And um, there is some evidence for that. These large cross-cultural data sets like the Standard Cross-Cultural Survey or the Ethnographic Atlas do show this association between belief in these powerful moralizing deities and uh, various measures of social complexity or social scale. Um, so there's some association there. Um, the question is, what's the causal relationship there? Is it that the gods help the society increase in scale, or the shared belief in these gods, uh, or um, are they just like a reflection of the society? Like if you've got a society with powerful moralizing leaders who will mm -hmm. punish people who step out of line, does that encourage a religious system that reflects that? In which case it's not really doing much causal work. Um, so there are different ways of getting at that um, and trying to go beyond the correlations. One of the things I've shown is that those cross-cultural data sets like the standard cross-cultural survey, the correlations they show between these powerful deities and more complex societies are almost entirely driven by Abrahamic religions, like this, basically the spread of Christianity and Islam. Yeah. And the problem with that, it comes back to this non-independence issue again, that the Christianity and Islam spread out from, you know, around the Mediterranean and um, they spread with a whole lot of other, well, first of all, it, they didn't just have high gods, they had sacred texts and universalism and some other interesting features. Maybe it was those features that were important. And second, they spread with other non-religious technologies mm -hmm. like money, tools for trade or warfare. Yeah. And maybe that that's what was key. So it's like suggestive, the correlation, but not um, super compelling. Um, some of the work I did with um, people in the lab here, uh, like um, Joseph Watts and Oliver Sheehan and Russell Gray, um, we looked at, across the Austronesian language family mm -hmm. um, at the evolution of these beliefs in uh, powerful punishing deities um, through time and um, tried to test these hypotheses that way in a way that could hopefully get at the causal um, direction. Mm -hmm. And the basic idea is I, I was talking about these um, genealogies of languages right. um, that you can build up based on the similarities between languages. And turns out um, the Austronesian language family is the biggest, if or, or one of the biggest in the world, 1,200 or more languages. So it's a, a huge um, family of languages that we know they're related and we know most of the relationships between those languages. So it's this amazing record of cultural evolution. And we know about the religious beliefs of a lot of the tips of this cult. We know um, whether they believe in gods that are care about human affairs and if they do do they punish um, transgressions what kind of transgressions do they punish so we can code up that data at the tips of this this big tree and we can also we also have data on the scale of those societies they can be small scale societies um, or simple chiefdoms or complex chiefdoms or even states across the Austronesian world and so what we were able to do in that paper was if you map the religious data onto the tips of the tree and the cultural data onto the tips of the tree, you can model the evolution of the two traits through time and ask what fits better, a model in which the traits are evolving independently 
or a model in which they co-evolve. So whether you've got a powerful punishing deity or not affects whether or not you become more politically complex and vice versa. Right. And we can compare the different model fits. Uh, and when we did that, we found that um, two really interesting things. First of all, there is an association uh, through time, but um, what we found was it was what we called broad supernatural punishment. So just the, the idea in the culture that there are deities um, that can punish, um, can punish behaviors that are not cooperative, that that predicts an increase in social complexity through time. Um, so that kind of fits with this idea of the supernatural policing or supernatural punishment hypothesis that this might have played this this it's not just a product of social complexity it's a potential cause um, but the the societies that had the really powerful what we call high gods like created deities because um, some have argued that that's what's key um, we didn't find any evidence for that. So, in fact, those deities seem to follow increase in social complexity rather than predict it. So it's just in the Austronesian world, but it's a pretty nice test case uh, and fairly clear result that, yeah, punishment seems to be important for increasing social complexity, but um, maybe it doesn't have to be a particularly powerful God, just the idea that there are supernatural agents out there that will punish you if you misbehave is enough. Um, yeah, so that's been some attempts to do more to answer the question. Um, more recently, um, there's a paper that tried to test, uh, looked at the relative timing of the emergence of political complexity mm -hmm. and these powerful punitive deities and they it was a nice idea which comes first like if you get the deities right before you get the social complexity maybe that's the causal link but if you get the social complexity before you get the deities then the deities kind of caused the the social complexity right mm -hmm. um, so they tried to test that but it was controversial because um before you have social complexity you often don't have any way of record keeping and writing stuff down. Um, and therefore we can't tell reliably whether or not you had the, we, whether or not you had this big, powerful, punitive mm -hmm. deity. And so there was a big controversy around that as to whether um, the absence of these deities at earlier times was really that they weren't there or was just that you couldn't, tell and so they argued that the social complexity came first and the deities came later but um yeah it was controversial because people argued well uh it looks like you just don't have any evidence before large social complexity um and when you account for that it looks like there's not much of a relationship and i think yeah the paper was uh, ultimately retracted but i think the the authors are still um, yeah, working on you know, how to make that argument. Mm -hmm. So another question, uh, why is it that in some stratified societies we find ritual human sacrifice? What role does it play there? Um, well, yeah. What role could it play? It seems like highly dysfunctional and horrible that, well, it is horrible, but um, that, you know, ritually killing other humans. Uh, but there is an argument that it, that it is functional at this level of the society for holding things together. It's called the social control hypothesis, that ritual human sacrifice basically legitimizes um, the authority and and in so doing stabilizes the social hierarchy. Um, yeah, the idea is basically that if you can, yeah, if you can 
show publicly sometimes that you can put someone to death that's like what greater display of authority could there be and that this legitimizes your own authority as well as providing a bit of a threat for people who challenge that authority um and so we this was another example of an idea that we could test in the austronesian language family um again there's this question of is there a, a correlation between the two and if there is what comes first right. so we use the same approach that i was just talking about to but right but mapping onto the tips of the austronesian tree um the level of social stratification in the societies so do they have this clear hierarchy and then whether or not they use ritual human sacrifice mm -hmm. um, which which comes first and what we found was that ritual human sacrifice um, both makes it more likely for you to see a shift to greater stratification and when you've got greater stratification if you've got ritual human sacrifice you're less likely to lose it so it supports this idea that it's it is functioning to kind of reinforce and stabilize um social stratification mm -hmm. um what do we know about the spread of Christianity. I mean, was it more of a top-down process driven by political leaders or a bottom-up process that sort of empowered social underclasses? Yeah, well, that is, yeah, a big question that people have been arguing about for a long time, um, particularly with regard to the spread of early Christianity, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, there's this top-down argument for the spread of early Christianity that like Constantine converts to Christianity yeah. and that this facilitates or mandates the spread of Christianity across much of Europe. Um, but others argue that no Christianity spread because it, this, um, the kind of egalitarian ethos that it embodied, um, was appealing to low status people and they picked it up and spread like wildfire and Constantine just kind of saw the writing on the wall and reacted to the spread. Like, yeah. So, um, top down versus bottom up. Um, and that debate has been going on for a long time and, uh, difficult to resolve now, but this was another example where the Pacific, this amazing kind of um, test bed for all kinds of models of social evolution uh, we thought could um, help out um, because uh, Christianity has relatively recently spread across the Pacific um, and in, uh, and the, the missionaries who spread it kept pretty good records of what was going on. So we have a pretty good idea of where it spread, when it spread, how quickly. Um, and so some work we did on that looked at uh, a sample of Pacific Island communities and looked at what determined how quickly Christianity spread through those communities. Um, and there are different hypotheses you can come up with. If you think, um, well, one hypothesis is that political hierarchy is going to be really important, but in the top down case, it could be really important because there is a hierarchy that can then mandate a change in the belief system. Mm -hmm. um, and also that hierarchy, the, 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 the hierarchical structure would be a way of propagating in an idea quickly through a large population. So one of the things we did was looked at across this sample of Pacific Islands that were um, converted to Christianity, uh, did political hierarchy predict, so did greater political hierarchy predict faster conversion? Mm -hmm. And we found it did. Um, so that kind of supports this idea that there's, you know, hierarchy is playing a role. Um, also, 
uh, you might argue that if it's to do with the kind of bottom up um, appeal to lower classes, then it should have spread more quickly in societies that had greater inequality, mm. right? Because it's this um, lower class that it would appeal to. We didn't find any evidence for that, at least in the Pacific. Um, and then the other thing we looked at was just the size of the population. Like, if it was completely top down, then it shouldn't matter that much. You know, the chief just says, we're doing it this way and we're doing it that way. Whereas if there's some kind of social transmission process that's important, then the size of the population itself should play a role. And we find, we do find um, quite strong support for that as well. So the, um, that I guess the lesson from that is on these Pacific islands that were undergoing missionization, it looks like um, the leadership structure and hierarchy played a role for sure. Mm -hmm. But then it's also this important slower process of spread through the population that has to play out. So it, it wasn't um, conversion by decree, really. Um, yeah. Right. So uh, I have one final question that comes from a patron, Bernard Seixas, uh, and he says, uh, what do you think about the theory that religious indoctrination has to occur during a sensitive period of development for it to be effective? Richard Dawkins suggests that religion has to be taught during infancy slash childhood for it to have long lasting effects so what do you think about that yeah well so it's not something i've worked on directly i do think that i mean there are all kinds of elements of human experience that are kind of more deeply felt earlier in your life and can just as a result of that have greater implications for the rest of your life um so that seems plausible um uh, you know, why would religion be different? Is religion special in that regard? I'm not sure. I don't know what evidence Dawkins was appealing to, but I do know that there are plenty of people who convert to religions much later in life, sometimes very late in life. And I wasn't aware that this is a like less profound conversion mm -hmm. or, you know, I don't know. I, but I, I definitely think the deterministic claim that you have to be converted early on is obviously not right. Um, I guess the question is how important is it? And yeah, I'm not sure. I think, I think it's still possible to have a pretty compelling, robust conversion experience later in life. There's plenty of examples of that. Yeah, I, I guess that in this particular case, uh, Bernardo was alluding to the fact that Richard Dawkins sometimes claims that uh, people, particularly children, have necessarily to be indoct indoctrinated into religion to be religious, to believe in some sort of supernatural entities or something like that. So, Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, nobody's... It's, they're hard experiments to run because religion is so ubiquitous that, um, you know, there's always some influence from the dominant religious systems. But um, I don't know. I, I feel like there are stories where people have, um, you know, like, yeah, found God much later in life and... Uh, yeah, it seems like it's probably not a necessary condition to have that early exposure. But that's not to say it's not, you know, probabilistically really important. That mm -hmm. Maybe it is. That, like, it, maybe it's quite hard to have those experiences later in life. But they're there. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Oh, right. Um, 
Yeah, well, like you said, we're in the um, Language Cognition and Culture Lab uh, here at the University of Auckland, uh, so you can Google that, or um, my website is quentinatkinson.com, and there's information there about what I'm interested in at the moment and how to get in touch with me. So, yeah, if you found this chat interesting, please get in touch. Okay, great. I will be leaving links to that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Atkinson, thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show, and it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show, and it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of this interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Wittingberg, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Ian Riccalenia, John Connors, Paulina Varen, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Wo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narci, Arthur Co, Zuc, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurban, Simon Columbus, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernadini, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrin, Kuala Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Aslan Bullet, Nathan Nui, and Stanton T. Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. John Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araujo, Romain Roach, Dermito Gregoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, John Linares, Lida Cosmidis, Saima Afzal, Adrian Gagey, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Dennis Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Todd Shackelford, Sunny Smith and John Wisman. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Luis Caetano, Tom Wagner, Dan Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardus Francis, Thomas Trumbull, and Nuno Welder, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.